Hi, I'm Stuart Molina, Music Director of the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra, and today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the music that we'll be featuring in our second Masterworks concert of this pandemic era. Uh, the first, as you probably remember, featured music entirely for strings. Uh, today we mix the instruments together. We have uh, wonderful music from three different periods of music history uh, for a mixed ensemble. We begin with music of the composer Erwin Scholhoff. Scholhoff is in all likelihood a composer that you don't know much about. Um, he's of a whole generation of Jewish composers um, that disappeared. Uh, he perished in the Holocaust in 1942, uh, dying of tuberculosis in a, a concentration camp. Uh, and his music was prohibited in Germany before his death. Uh, his music kind of disappeared until oh, the early 2000s when James Conlon started his project to resurrect the music uh, of this period and of these composers that had disappeared. Scholhoff's music, I think, is absolutely wonderful, delightful, interesting, uh, and I think you'll enjoy this selection that we've chosen, uh, which is his jazz suite, uh, otherwise known as the Suite for Chamber Orchestra. Um, a little bit about Scholhoff first. He was born in Prague at the very end of the 19th century. Uh, he was born to fairly wealthy parents, and he had great musical training. Um, he studied at the conservatory in Prague. He then went to Germany and studied uh, in several of the conservatories there. He studied with such luminaries as Rager and Debussy. Um, and he was kind of a, a rising star, both as a pianist uh, and as a composer. Then World War I hit, and in World War I, he fought for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This, of course, was a devastating time for all of Europe, and particularly uh, psychologically damaging uh, for the young men that fought in this horrible war. Uh, he survived the war, uh, but he came out extremely dispirited and disillusioned. Um, and he started looking to other non-traditional music forms. And there were two major influences uh, for Scholhoff that I'd like to mention. The first is jazz. Scholhoff was, in fact, a jazz pianist. He wasn't a classical composer who then kind of was influenced by jazz, but he came from within jazz. Jazz actually infuses everything that he writes. Uh, and the second influence on Scholhoff is Dadaism. Dadaism was the movement at the time which kind of uh, preached anarchy, preached, preached throwing away all constrictions that had been put on art and culture um, and uh, approaching things from kind of a nihilistic uh, point of view. Um, at the very beginning of this piece, he starts with actually a poem and I would like to just read you um, a slight bit of this poem, if I can find it. Um, this is the end of the poem, and it sounds like this. Grant me unheard of powers. I will eat you all into the sausage machine with you, band of pigs. Then, then comes the moment in the cosmos when I will be transformed in bare aspirin. So... Clearly, there's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek attitude towards this piece. Um, clearly, he's influenced by Dadaism, uh, but through the title, Jazz Suite, um, and also through the music itself, it's much more of a piece influenced by jazz than by Dadaism. It, in fact, doesn't throw away anything. Uh, it, it's, it's very much uh, music that's delightful to the ear, music that fits into forms. Uh, of course, he uses his own musical vocabulary in writing these delightful pieces that comprise the six pieces of the suite. Let me talk a little bit about those pieces. So the first movement uh, is called Ragtime. Uh, being a jazz pianist, he certainly knew a lot about the rags of Scott Joplin and the other great ragtime writers. Uh, this is kind of his own approach to ragtime. It features the syncopations that you find in ragtime, ragged time is why it's called ragtime, and that features syncopations, uh, broken rhythms that are not uh, straight on the beats but off the beats. And it starts right away with a syncopated statement in the trumpet, and this is kind of what the opening sounds like. That's 
kind of it. Um, what you'll notice in terms of his orchestration is it sounds very much along uh, the lines of composers like Poulenc in the French school, like Kurt Weill in the German school. It's a small ensemble, and he uses interesting combinations of instruments, just solo strings, a single trumpet, a couple of horns, a bunch of scattered woodwinds. Um, so it almost has kind of a, a pit band sound, and he uses percussion as well. Um, four percussionists in this piece using a wide variety of instruments. But in this opening, it's kind of a delightful, syncopated, fun, uh, jazzy ragtime. The second movement he calls the Boston Waltz. Um, this is an example of what we would call a hesitation waltz with kind of built-in uh, pregnant pauses within the melody. Um, and it's a very simple waltz. He, in fact, starts with just a solo violin and a harp accompanying the violin, uh, and the melody will be handed off from the violin to the cello, to the viola, back to the violin. Um, this is how this waltz sounds at the beginning. on in this very simple way, but with a lot of, uh, of the traditional, almost Viennese approach to a waltz, a lot of rubato, meaning time that you steal and then return, um, beautiful turns of the phrase. Again, very understated uh, and very beautiful, I think. The third movement uh, is a tango. Um, this one is very much in the style of uh, the Argentine tango. But again, with more than a little bit of a dab of Kurt Weill, it brings to mind, uh, when I listen to it, uh, the very famous tango from the uh, Three Penny Opera. Um, but uh, Schulhoff's tango features solo instruments that are accompanied uh, by the, the rest of the orchestra, which plays a very straight uh, tango rhythm, while the solo instruments have a lot of freedom, a lot of time, uh, to play around with his beautiful melody. So this is the beginning of that tango with a solo violin playing the melody. So again, a lot of kind of wide open pauses where the solo instrument gets to uh, be extremely expressive while when the rhythm is playing, it's very deliberately straightforward. Um, I will play one other section from this. In the middle of the piece, it picks up tempo a little bit. It gets a little bit faster. And you have a very simple duet, uh, which starts out uh, between a solo muted trumpet and flute uh, and kind of provides a nice contrast to this opening drama. so forth. Uh, after the, uh, uh, the tango, we have a movement which is called shimmy, which was a popular dance of the 1920s. Um, and this one also has kind of smatterings of jazz to it, certainly more than a little bit of a feeling of ragtime in it, and also features at the beginning the melody starting in the trumpet. Uh, and this is a little bit of the beginning of that. from there. 
The next movement after the shimmy is for only percussion. So the four percussionists play together. Uh, it's called step. Um, this one, I actually like to think that this one is a little bit ironic, a little bit sardonic. Um, it starts off very much like a military march with a field drum and a snare drum playing together. But then you have the introduction of instruments like the ratchet, which is an instrument that, uh, well, I don't know, I would have called it a grogger. It's, it's a <laughs> kind of sounding instrument. You have cymbals, you have bass drum, uh, and it becomes a little bit more uh, mixed in terms of the rhythms, uh, straying a little bit from the straight military march of the very beginning. Uh, and it drives with an enormous accelerando, enormous speeding up at the end of this movement uh, to its finish. And then the last movement he calls jazz. Now this I think is kind of interesting because in my experience, this is the least jazzy of the movements. There's no sense of syncopation really. There's no sense of, uh, of blue notes. There's no sense of weird harmony. Um, it's just an extremely driven, fast movement uh, to end the suite um, with, with kind of a very straightforward rhythm in two. So this is what this sounds like. he calls it jazz, uh, but he does. Perhaps he's being sarcastic, um, but regardless of what it is, it brings this, uh, this opening number uh, to a thrilling conclusion. The second piece on our program uh, is a very beautiful, surprisingly intimate piece by Richard Wagner. When I say surprisingly, and when we think about Richard Wagner, we think about his big ring operas uh, or the Flying Dutchman or Parsifal, these enormous overblown masterpieces. This is a piece that's deliberately extremely intimate. Uh, it was written in 1869 as a gift uh, to his wife uh, after the birth of their son, which they named Siegfried, after the hero uh, in the Ring operas. Um, the story of this piece is actually kind of, it, on the one hand, a little bit sordid, on the other hand, uh, quite charming. The sordid part is the pre-story. Uh, his wife, Cosima Wagner, was married before that to Hans von Bülow, the great pianist and conductor, uh, and a friend of Wagner's. Uh, Wagner and Cosima started having an affair. Uh, they actually had a child um, that uh, not until much later did, uh, did Wagner even uh, admit was his own because of the potential scandal that would have been attached to such an, a pronouncement. Um, but back in 1864, they were all together at a, a retreat, uh, a vacation, and Cosima and Richard consummated uh, their relationship that night. Um, and now fast forward several years later, uh, a couple of more kids, Siegfried is born, uh, and now Wagner wants to give his wife a gift. And so he writes this piece, um, but he features as the main theme a melody that he wrote based on that first encounter back in 1864. Um, so when she heard this melody, there was no doubt, I'm sure, in her mind of what he was referring to. Um, but it was a, a theme that was associated with deep love and with uh, the beginning of something that they considered very beautiful. On this Christmas day in 1869, um, Wagner woke Cosima up to this music. He actually had 15 musicians on the stairs at their villa performing the Siegfried Idol. And uh, in fact, they could only fit 15 people. And so the conductor himself took on the short trumpet part, teaching himself trumpet uh, in preparation for this occasion. So Cosimo woke up uh, to the strains of this beautiful melody that she knew very well, moving on into this glorious piece of music. Um, and, uh, and I think it was probably a very successful Christmas gift on the part of Richard Wagner. So what can I say about the piece? Well, first of all, it's written for a very small ensemble. It was initially, in, initially intended uh, to be played by um, a group the size of which we are in fact performing it with single strings on the string parts, a small wind section, uh, and uh, just a, a, a couple of horns, and that's really it. 
Um, one trumpet, as I said, that comes in just for about 15 measures, about two thirds of the way through. Um, and it's a piece that has thematic uh, material that comes from the Ring operas. Um, as you may know, the Ring is comprised of melodies which he called leitmotifs. Uh, so each character, each emotion, each idea uh, represented in the Ring opera has its own leitmotif. And so in a sense, he's telling the story through the way he combines these melodies that become very familiar as you sit through the 16 or so hours uh, of the Ring cycle. Um, and so the ideas behind these melodies were probably well known to him, well known to Cosima. He was writing the opera Siegfried at the same time that he wrote the Siegfried Idol. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, so let me play a little bit of this piece. Um, it begins with a melody, as I mentioned before. This is the melody from the consummation of their relationship. Uh, and in the opera Siegfried, in the final scene, he uses this melody as one of the great love themes um, of this doomed couple. Uh, but it's a doomed couple that have just uh, found themselves in the craziest ecstasy of, of love. And so here's the opening, very intimate, very quiet, and a very beautiful theme. goes on that's probably the major theme in this work the other major theme that you'll hear uh, which is introduced by the trumpet I'm sorry not by the trumpet by the uh, by the oboe um, is a cradle song and this was a, a song that probably anyone at the time who heard this piece would know uh, this melody and this is how that one goes simple melody, um, again, kind of appropriate for the birth of a small child. Um, and, uh, and you'll hear again, this melody will come back many times throughout this piece. There are a couple of other little motives that you'll hear. Um, one is introduced by the horn. And in the, uh, in the opera, this is one of Siegfried's main melodies. And uh, this is how that one goes. you'll hear in the in the flute um, the, the motif of a bird um, this will be heard in the operas um, but I think he's just representing nature around him and the bird song that he hears uh, in the mornings when he awakens and so again at the end of this melody you'll hear this bird song Uh, and in Siegfried, you'll hear the same kind of bird song um, when Siegfried is, um, is hearing the bird actually speaking to him, telling him about what his fate is going to be, that he's going to find Brunhilde, he's going to rescue her, he's going to be the greatest hero of all time. Um, there's so much that I could say about this piece. It's, it's such a glorious, wonderful, unique work. Um, there is one harmonic thing that I will mention, and that's the use of the augmented chord. Um, you all know major chords, which comprise of a major third followed by a minor third. That's the basis of all tonal uh, harmony. Then you have the minor chord, which is a minor third followed by a major third. But there are two chords that you can make up by not combining uh, minor thirds and major thirds, but rather by sticking with minor thirds, which would be what we call a diminished seventh chord. Uh, and the other is by combining major third and major third. 
I like to think of this as kind of a question mark chord because it's kind of in nowhere land. You don't know really where it's going to lead. Now, in the middle of the uh, 19th century, Franz Liszt particularly led a school of harmony, which was called chromaticism, and it was using these diminished chords and augmented chords uh, to move harmony around in ways that weren't before possible. When you're dealing with major and minor chords, there is not an ambiguity about what they mean in a tonal world. This is a C major chord. There's no other way to look at it. You can use two of the notes to make an A minor chord, but that is a C major chord. This is a C augmented chord, but it also is an E augmented chord, and it's also a G sharp augmented chord. And that, the reason for that is that the, the major thirds can be combined to make a complete octave and start again. And so no matter where you start, it's the same chord. And so what that allows you to do is, let's say you, want, you, you could use the augmented chord as a five chord. So C augmented to F. But you could be playing an F. And then suddenly use this. degree of an A chord uh, and change key just suddenly to A and then you could change key suddenly uh, to C sharp major or to any number of other harmonies. This is all stuff you don't really have to understand but I do want you to get used to this sound in the Siegfried Idol because he uses it a lot um, and in particular in a long section in three which will be introduced by an augmented chord in the woodwinds and then goes into this very pretty melody. And then again the augmented chord. And so on and so forth. Um, but you'll hear this augmented harmony a lot, whether sometimes you'll hear with, a, with kind of a heartbeat fluttering underneath it. Um, but this is Wagner. I and mean, Wagner was friendly with Liszt. Um, in fact, he was extremely friendly with Liszt. And he was also um, uh, deeply influenced by Liszt and by Liszt's harmonies, particularly his use of these, uh, these chords and the world of chromaticism. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy this performance of Siegfried Idol. It's one of my favorite pieces by Wagner. Um, and I think it's just charming, and I'm looking forward to hearing what our orchestra does with it. The final piece on our program um, will be an extremely familiar piece uh, to virtually everybody, um, but in a orchestration that will be almost completely unfamiliar to everybody. Uh, the piece is Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, uh, one of his, well, one of his nine greatest symphonies. In my mind, perhaps the best of them all. Certainly one of my top favorite two or three. Um, and it's a piece that was written in the early 19th century, uh, between the years uh, 1811 and 1812. Beethoven was going deaf. He was obviously very unhappy about that. But despite that, this was a period of relative well-being for him. He was at a bohemian spa, um, nursing his health. Um, he was happy, he was wealthy, he was extremely famous. Um, and so this is a piece that I think reflects uh, a lot of satisfaction, a lot of great joy. Um, really the only uh, somber moments in this piece uh, come in the second movement, which is an extraordinary work of genius. Um, but the first, third, and fourth movements, movements are pieces of uh, unabashed, exuberant uh, love of life, um, love of humanity. Um, Wagner called this piece the apotheosis of the dance. I don't know if I really go along with that. Yes, certainly there are dance rhythms, particularly in the first and last movements. Um, but I think of this much more as just a celebration of what it means to be a joyful human. Um, this is humanity at, at its most uh, exal exultant. Uh, and uh, it's a, joy, a, a joyful piece to listen to, a joyful piece to perform. 
Um, the orchestration that we're going to use, uh, obviously we can't put together a large orchestra uh, because of the times. And so I thought it would be fun to do this new, new, well, not new, but new, this different version of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. This one is uh, orchestrated for woodwind nanet. So nine woodwind instruments. Um, the instruments are two oboes, two clarinets, three bassoons, so two normal bassoons and one contra bassoon, which is the giant, extremely low bassoon, the bass instrument of the woodwind section. Uh, and then two horns, two French horns. It would be very hard to imagine the Seventh Symphony without the horns. There are moments um, that are absolutely iconic as French horn moments. Um, the idea of performing music of this period for a woodwind ensemble was not at all uncommon. Um, there were many, many, many pieces which at the time were much better known as woodwind ensemble pieces than as the orchestral works uh, that they had been uh, patterned after. Um, one good example of this is the opera Fidelio. Right after Fidelio was written, a woodwind uh, uh, arrangement of this was written and it just got a lot more playing because it was easier uh, to put together than a full opera production. Um, and so we are going to do this nanette. Now what's interesting about it um, is that we have no idea who wrote it. There were many people at the time that wrote these arrangements. Um, this one, we're going to have to just do a, a tribute as anonymous because there is no scholarship uh, as to who originally put it together. But I think it's extremely skillfully done. Um, and uh, again, I'm very intrigued to see how it all comes together uh, as a woodwind on net. I've taken the liberty of adding to it uh, a pair of timpani, uh, the big kettle drums, um, because again, I think so much of the sound of the piece comes from uh, the underlying rhythm. And I think adding the timpani will add a great deal of personality um, and, and also authenticity to the sound. Uh, I don't really want to say all too much about the piece because it's a piece that's very familiar and a piece that speaks extremely beautifully for itself. But again, when we think about Ludwig von Beethoven, or at least when I think about Ludwig von Beethoven, I think that his greatest achievement um, was in capturing what it means to be a human being. And when I say that, uh, a lot of people point to Beethoven's music and they find it, it's not perfect music, not at all in the sense of like Mozart's music, which you, it just seems like there isn't a single note that's out of place and it was just conceived in the celestial spheres and then placed on earth. Beethoven uh, is music that struggles, music that clearly Beethoven struggled to write. We know this from seeing his manuscripts, but also music that uh, in the music itself, there's this sense of underlying struggle and, uh, and, and glorious success over the struggle. Um, this probably uh, is one of the very best examples of this um, from the, uh, the, 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 the galloping movement of the, of the first movement of uh, this piece uh, to the extremely driven final movement. Um, it takes us on a journey uh, as I said, through kinds of the depths of the second movements and extremely somber, extremely deep, extremely wrenching melodies that, that come along with its own driving rhythm. Uh, and then the third movement, which is just kind of wacky and fun and, uh, and extremely fast. Um, I just think this is one of the wonderful works of the entire classical music canon. Uh, and I'm so excited to be able to do it for this new uh, kind of ensemble for the symphony. This isn't a way that the Harrisburg Symphony would ever perform this piece except in these times. And so the way I'm looking at it is, you know, I guess there might be some kind of a silver lining to this extremely dark cloud uh, that is the pandemic. And that silver lining is that we're able to explore this whole repertoire of different kinds of classical and even orchestral music uh, to perform for you. I hope you will enjoy this performance. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching uh, these uh, comments that I've made, uh, and I hope that you'll all uh, watch our stream, which begins uh, in just a couple of days. Um, so uh, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy.